Hello, everybody. I guess this is the price we uh, pay for good weather. Anyway, it's wonderful to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers for doing such an amazing job. So thanks a lot, guys. So I guess we'll go ahead and throw up the first slide. So I am a population geneticist, really a geneticist and anthropologist. Now, population geneticist sounds kind of scary and technical. What does that mean? Well. My overarching goal, my theme that I investigate as a scientist, is the patterns of human diversity around the world. We are an incredibly diverse species. You, know, you travel, you walk down the street in a major city, you see people who seem to be so different from each other and from ourselves. And we're also distributed everywhere. We're a global species. And this is something where, you know, I've read a lot of kind of accounts of early explorers, Captain Cook and so on. Uh, when I was younger, and these guys were like cruising around the world, 18th century, they crash ashore on some island in the South Pacific, and they see people living there, and they never kind of questioned why that was. And they noticed that they were somewhat similar to people they'd seen elsewhere, but different in some ways as well. Really, the goal of our research as population geneticists, at least human population geneticists, is to try and answer the question of, okay, how did we become such a globally distributed species? So that's the big overarching theme of our work. But like any big theme in science, you could break it down into sub-themes or questions that you can chip away at using the tools of generating data, hypotheses coming down on one side or the other. First question we can ask is one of origins. Are we, in fact, all related to each other? And if so, how closely? And the second is a question of journey. If we do spring from a common source as a species, how do we come to occupy every corner of the globe in the process of generating these patterns of diversity that we see today. Well, historically, the way this has been approached is by going out and digging things up out of the ground, stones and bones, archaeology and paleoanthropology, and saying, largely on the basis of morphology, this looks a little bit more like my cousin Fred than that does. This is the missing link. This is where we originated. This is the origin of our species. What I'd like to suggest, though, is that while the field of paleoanthropology in particular gives us lots of fascinating possibilities about our origins as a species, and some insights possibly into the journey question, it doesn't give us the probabilities about direct lines of descent that we really want. Possibilities, but not probabilities. What do I mean by that? Well, this is a great example. What you're looking at here are three extinct species of hominid potential human ancestors from left to right, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and Paranthropus boisei, say that three times fast, robust Australopithecine, all uncovered from the same location in northern Kenya and all dating to roughly the same time, about two million years ago. So we've got three potential ancestors living in the same place at the same time. That means not all three could have left descendants down to me. Which one of these guys am I actually directly biologically connected to? I don't know. Possibilities about our history, but not the probabilities about direct lines of descent that we really want. Well, we as a, po we as, as a field of population geneticists take a different approach. We really kind of turn the question on its head. Instead of going out and digging things up out of the past and guessing at how they may or may not connect up to the present and to us, we start in the present and we work our way back in time because we know that we all had parents and those parents had parents, and their parents had parents, and so on. So there is an unbroken biological lineage going back in time. Now, genealogy, really popular hobby. I'm sure lots of people in the audience have constructed family trees. You can go back maybe five, possibly 10 generations. Do we want to see it? <laughs> I guess that's why they're raising the lights. Second most popular hobby after gardening, apparently. It's boys who overtake gardening, I'm told. But the point is that no matter how far back you can trace your family history in the written record, ultimately that written record runs out. And we hit what the genealogists call a brick wall. And beyond that, we simply, simply enter this dark and mysterious realm we call history. And in my case, ultimately prehistory. But it turns out we're all carrying something inside of ourselves, which is in effect a written historical document in our DNA. And that allows us to see back beyond the written record, beyond that brick wall, back to the very earliest days of our species, and start to get the answers to these questions of origins and journeys. Well, quick primer on DNA. For those of you who have not taken a molecular genetics course recently, you know who you are. 
There's going to be a quiz at the end, so anyway. Uh, long linear molecule, the famous double helix described by Watson and Crick back in 1953, composed of four subunits. We denote them A, C, G, and T. And it's the sequence of these A's, C's, G's, and T's that basically provides a blueprint to make another version of you. And there are billions of these A's, C's, G's, and T's in the human genome. It's a lot of information. If you took all of the DNA out of one tiny microscopic cell in your body, it would be about six feet long. So it's a huge amount of information. And in every generation, you've got to copy all of this information to pass it on to your kids. And you've got to copy it in about eight hours, which is how long it takes your cells to replicate your DNA. And it's really important, so you want to get it right. So it's like copying the longest book you can imagine. So think of a really long book, War and Peace. Imagine a 1,000 volumes of that. And so you've got to copy that by hand in eight hours. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to get your Red Bull or coffee or whatever you choose to drink, and you're going to sit there and go back and forth and check and double check to make sure you get this information right. But inevitably, what's going to happen as you're doing this? You're going to make a typo, a spelling mistake. That happens at the DNA level as well. They're called mutations. And they occur at a low but a measurable rate of around 100 mutations per genome per generation. So every child is carrying around 100 novel changes, these typos in their DNA, relative to their parents, clicking off in a clock-like fashion every generation. Now, when these, these typos or mutations get passed down through the generations, they become markers of descent. So it turns out if you share one of these changes in your DNA with another person, you share an ancestor person in the past who first had that change in their DNA and passed it on to the two of you. And that's how we can connect people up into ever deeper branches of the human family tree. Now, what do these markers actually look like? Well, this is an example of actual DNA sequencing data. Five individuals lined up here, one, two, three, four, five, same region of the genome has been sequenced. They've been aligned. Reading down through the sequences, the first thing you'll notice is they basically look identical. GCCT, GCCT, and so on. That's the first thing that comes out of every single one of our studies of human genetic variation. Humans are 99.9% .9 identical at the DNA level. We only differ on average at one in every thousand nucleotide positions from someone we're not even related to. That's actually a remarkably low level of genetic variation compared to our great ape cousins. So the gorillas, the chimps, the orangutans have between four and 10 times as much genetic variation as we do. And we think of them as being on the brink of extinction or at least endangered. This is a sign, actually, of a near extinction event that our species went through about 70,000 years ago, when the total number of human beings alive on Earth dropped down to as few as 2,000. 2,000 people. And we came back from that, and we still carry the signals of that near extinction event in our DNA with this low level of variation. So it's quite difficult to find these genetic markers, but if you look carefully enough, down here in this region, G, 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 A, G, a single letter change from a G to an A, that's an example of a genetic marker. If you share that A with someone else, you share an ancestor, a person who uh, first had that change and passed it on to the two of you. Now, by asking a very open-ended question, sampling people from all over the world, looking at their pattern of genetic markers, asking, how does the tree fall out? What is the, what is the pattern we see in the tree? We've been able to construct family trees for everybody alive today. Everybody in this room, in fact, everybody walking around on planet Earth, falls somewhere onto one of the branches of these family trees. We focused in particular on two pieces of DNA that have proven to be really important for our understanding of origins and journey. Mitochondrial DNA, um, mtDNA on the left, this traces a purely maternal lineage. Everybody's carrying this, but only women pass it on. Okay, so it tells you about your mom's side of the family, your mother's 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 mother, all the way back to the very first mother. The equivalent on the male side is known as the Y chromosome, and it's a little chunk of DNA that makes men men. It doesn't really have that much going for it apart from that, not that many genes. Uh, channel surfing, refusal to last for directions when you're <laughs> lost, and a few other male traits, but basically it determines maleness, and it, of course, is passed on from fathers to sons, so it, it traces a purely paternal line of descent. It tells you about your father's 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 father. So by looking at the pattern of genetic markers and people from all over the world, again, we've been able to construct family trees for everybody alive. Now, these are actually really simplified versions of the trees that we use when we're constructing the laboratory analyses, going out in the field and looking at new DNA samples, but they still look kind of complicated sitting out there in the audience, a little bit blurry. Let's combine them, simplify them even more, turn them on their side so that the roots at the bottom and the branches are coming off the top. What's the take-home message here? 
Well, it's that the longest branches, both the male and female sides, the longest branches in these family trees are found only in African populations. And because the length of the branches are proportional to the number of these mutational changes that we've had over time, ticking off in that clock-like fashion. What that means is that Africans have been accumulating genetic diversity for longer than any other group, and therefore that our species originated in Africa. Well, this isn't actually a new idea. Even Darwin suggested this over a century ago. He said, well, you know, as with most of the great apes, we most likely came from Africa. If you had taken physical anthropology a generation ago, you would have learned about Homo erectus leaving Africa perhaps millions of years ago and spreading out and evolving separately around the world into human races, as they still called them at that time. What's, the mo what's most amazing uh, from the DNA analysis, though, is how recently we all share in African origin. Within the last 200,000 years, we originated in Africa as a species. And it's only within the last 60,000 years or so, 2,000 human generations, that we've left that continent to populate the rest of the world. Evidence is that there was an early coastal migration that uh, moved through the Bab al-Mandab Strait, through the Arabian Peninsula, down through India, Southeast Asia, reaching Australia, the ancestors of the Aborigines, by around 50,000 years ago. A slightly later inland migration through the Middle East, moving up into Central Asia by 40,000 years ago, westward into Europe by 30,000, and a small, intrepid group of explorers, wanderers, if you will, touching on the theme of the, uh, the conference today, uh, crossing a short-lived land bridge, the Bering Land Bridge, between the old and the new worlds, moving into the Americas between 15 and 20,000 years ago during the last glacial maximum. And piecing together the details of these stories, not only the initial settlement and the timing of these events, but also much more recent migration events, which were a little bit more difficult to decipher, is the goal of the Genographic Project, which I direct for the National Geographic Society. Now, there are three core components to what we're doing in the project. At its heart, it's a research effort. And this is field research that's being carried out by myself, by my team of collaborators around the world, Human population geneticists focusing on indigenous and traditional populations living in their particular corner of the globe, North America, South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and so on. Now, why are indigenous and traditional groups so important to this work? Well, think about your own ancestry. I'll think about mine out loud. I have ancestors from all over northern and western Europe, and I live in the eastern seaboard of North America down in Washington, D.C., National Geographic headquarters. What does my DNA tell you about the ancient history of any of these places? It's really hard to tell. I'm a mutt. All the recent migration has kind of mixed up the story, and that's the case for so many of us today. What we ideally want are people who retain the link to their geography and to their ancestors and their ancestors' genetic patterns uh, that many of the rest of us have lost. And those are the world's indigenous and traditional peoples, forming the heart of what we're doing scientifically. But when we were designing the project, we didn't want it to just be the history of the world's 100 million, 200 million indigenous people. We wanted it to be the story of all of us, all 7.1 billion of us. So we wanted to open it up to members of the general public who can go onto our website, find out more about the project, and purchase a kit. This is all done anonymously. You can join the project and figure out how you fit into this growing family tree of humanity and join a real-time scientific project, which is kind of cool. It doesn't happen very often. You, know, you can't actually be there on the ground with a Mars rover mission or as part of the initial human genome project, but in this case, you can actually be a part of the science. Moreover, by doing that, this is all nonprofit, you have to fund the field research we're doing with the indigenous populations, as well as the third component of the project, the legacy fund. And this is the grant-giving entity within the project that aims to give, give something tangible back to the world's indigenous and traditional peoples many of whom have a way of life that's endangered today. We are actually going through a period of cultural mass extinction at the moment that parallels the biodiversity crisis. Linguists tell us that of the 6,000 some odd languages spoken in the world today, by the end of the century, between half and 90% will no longer be spoken. They'll be gone. We're losing a language every two weeks. They're a process that makes sense. People leave behind their ancient villages. They move to a melting pot city, Mumbai, Sao Paulo, place like that. When they do, their kids enter the melting pot. They stop learning the, the old language, the traditional ways. And within a generation or two, that culture is endangered or extinct. So through these grants, led by the communities themselves, we're trying to raise awareness about this and to do something to slow it or even to halt it, if we can. And we've given out 85 grants through 2013, $2.2 million so far, just some examples of projects we're funding, an effort to save the Yagnobi language, which was once the lingua franca of the Silk Road, now spoken by only about 1,500 people in Tajikistan, 
Um, project to uh, preserve traditional Aboriginal dance patterns in the Northern Territories of Australia, their song lines. The Healing Journey, a project to raise awareness about environmental issues along the Yukon River, collaboration among several tribal groups up there. And then an interesting project with the Shuar people of Ecuador trying to preserve their ethnobotanical knowledge, which of course includes many medicinal plants as well. So just some examples of some of the projects that we're funding. Now, I'm often asked by people, what's the biggest surprise that's come out of the project? And for me, there have been lots of scientific discoveries, but the most exciting thing has been the power of what I like to call citizen science. And citizen science is talked about more and more these days. Getting the general public actively in engaged in the scientific effort. Not just by providing lots of data, and they certainly have, so 600,000 people have purchased our kits so far, which has been tr a tremendous success and has really launched this whole field of consumer genetic testing. But it's the active engagement on the part of people who are curious about the results and are actually helping to drive forward the science. And this is a great example. This came to light by accident, actually. A woman wrote into the project a couple of years ago and said, listen, love what you guys are doing. Lots of members of my extended family have taken part, but in my case, you seem to have gotten it wrong. You need to retest me because you told me that I'm carrying a Central Asian or a Siberian uh, mitochondrial DNA lineage, and I know for a fact that I'm European. My ancestors came from a little village just outside of Budapest. I can show you church records going back to the 16th century. So clearly, I've got to have European DNA. Please retest me, thank you very much. Now when I heard this, I got really excited, not because I like retesting people, and in fact, of course, it, the results were correct, but rather because the Hungarians are a really interesting population within Europe. Most of Europe's languages, including the language I'm speaking now, French, German, Italian, Russian, uh, languages spoken down in India, Hindi, Farsi spoken in Iran, all belong to a language family known as Indo-European. And it's a Western Eurasian group of languages that all ultimately trace back to a common source several thousand years ago. But within Europe, there are a couple of outliers. There's Basque, which is unrelated to any other language, as far as we can tell, could have been brought here from Mars, linguistic isolate. And then there's Hungarian, and Hungarian actually is related to other languages. Finnish and the Sami language spoken by the Lap people in northern Scandinavia, the Finno-Ugric branch of what's called the Uralic language family. And as the name Uralic suggests, the center of diversity is over around the Ural Mountains or east of there in Siberia. It's really a Siberian language family. And this makes sense because we know the Magyar people migrated into the central European plains about a thousand years ago bringing with them the Hungarian culture, the Hungarian language, they settled down, had a tremendous cultural impact, a complete shift in the language from whatever was spoken there before. There should have been a genetic impact as well. Problem is, when we've gone in and done the typical sampling that you do in these studies, 50, 75 people, we haven't seen any trace of these Central Asian or Siberian genetic lineages. But when this woman wrote in about her result, we pulled the data that we had in the database. We had 2,300 people on the public side with Hungarian ancestry, and we're seeing at a very low level, but a detectable level now, 2 to 3% on both the male and female sides, these Central Asian or Siberian genetic lineages. The power of citizen science, not only the power of large numbers, but the power of a person's curiosity to draw our awareness to a new genetic pattern. And we've built this into the next phase of the project, which launched about a year and a half ago, Geno 2.0, very much trying to make use of the citizen science component to get people actively involved in the research. Leveraging the samples and the insights from the first phase, improving the technology, a new DNA testing chip that we've designed from the ground up, but really harnessing the power of the community and the users to learn new things about the genetic patterns. So you can go in and share your stories, see how you compare to other people in the database, even find out how Neanderthal you are. It turns out if you're non-African, you're carrying around 2% Neanderthal DNA. We met the Neanderthals and interbred with them about 50 to 60,000 years ago. So with that, I will end there. I've got the flashing screen over here. If you're interested in finding out more about the project, there's the URL. Check it out. Thank you. Thank you.